Hey, Road Warriors, this is Chris. Before we start today's show, just a few shout outs to give. First to our newest Patreon, Jade. Then to our newest YouTube subscribers, Scott Cairns, Renee Darkow, Carol Adima, Racer X, Alice McKinney, Joan Heater, Johnny Haley, Locked and Loaded, Richard Jackson, Southern Paranormal TV, Jared Dixon, Joey711999, and Don Dion Leon. Thanks for joining us on this cross country journey across America's darker side. Now on to the show. Welcome to episode 52, Washington. I'm your host, Chris. Joining me as always is James. And tonight we're going to be discussing Maltby's 13 Steps to Hell. Then we're going to get into the interesting story of Jake Bird, the serial killer. But first, James, how was your break? My break was fantastic, sir. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, man. I'm glad to be back at it. I'm excited to get on with these uh, topics because uh, both of these are new to me, so I'm excited to learn some new stuff. But first, let's go ahead and get into uh, your story. So your story is on Malt B's 13 Steps to Hell, is that yes, right? Yes, that is correct. All right, well, enlighten us with that, James. I certainly will. With graves dated all the way back to 1908, Malt B's Cemetery in King County is the location of this week's point of interest. Within this eerie setting is a 13-step stone staircase that descends into a family crypt. You know, old cemeteries, crypts, creepy stone staircases. What more could you want from a possibly haunted location? Actual ghosts? Actual, that would be nice. How about we add the fact that the family that is interred there were satanic worshippers and occultists? A tempting place for any curious thrill seeker, I would say. I would agree, absolutely. Absolutely, why not? Now, perhaps you are one of those who laughs in the face of such tales, and, you know, you might decide to tempt fate one day. You descend down the staircase one step at a time. With each step you take, you feel a little deathly silence enveloping you, and your whole life begins to flash before your eyes. And then you reach the bottom. You take a deep breath, glad that the ordeal is over, then you turn around with a sense of relief, only to find that you are no longer in a graveyard, but in hell itself. Or so the legend says. Cool. I, I thought that was pretty cool. Pretty neat, yeah, okay. You know, such a horrific vision would be enough to drive anyone mad, and apparently a lot of people have been driven insane after foolishly taking these steps. You know, I, I tried to dig up a little bit on that, and I really couldn't find any personal accounts. It's just very okay. generalistic in its... But I found it uh, interesting. I like places Yeah, like I mean, this. the idea of walking down steps in a graveyard and entering hell? Yeah, sounds cool to me. Sign me up. Now, paranormal investigators such as Chris and I relish a prized location such as this, and they are rare and often unobtainable. A lot oh, yeah. of times you can't get to these really, really good places. I'd be there in like a heartbeat. Heck yeah. The true recorded solid evidence is the goal of any credible investigator and the opportunity to explore or experience such a place is one in a million. We know that for a fact. I mean, we've been to lots of places that were... They're mm, super hyped up and then nothing happens. Nothing happens. Yeah. But sadly, or maybe fortunately, the steps were demolished or filled in quite some time ago and are no longer accessible, and the cemetery itself is no longer public. Oh, boo. I did read they have, a, they have chains and no trespassing signs everywhere. Uh, they were having teenage problems, partiers, crap like Big that. Big years, yeah. People messing things up. Now, the locals debate whether the steps were bulldozed, filled with cement, or sealed by an impenetrable door. Though they all agree that something did occur at the Maltby Cemetery, and the owners made sure it would never happen again. I think that goes back, like I said, to the partiers and things like that. Yeah. After further researching this legend, most accounts of this location and the stories are pretty common and repeated. You know, nothing really different. So, 
There wasn't much to it. Typical of an urban legend. Now, there have been incidents of bodies found in the nearby woods, and apparently there are still some who trespass on the land and claim to have encountered some ghostly activity. Very possible, but then again, if it's not substantiated with solid evidence, we just chalk it up to a simple ghost story or see it as someone trying to garner fame or attention. Which happens quite a bit. Happens a lot. Oh, yeah. It would be interesting to explore the tomb and try to collect evidence, but trespassing in any regard for investigations is a huge no-no in the Ghost Hunter handbook. You know, you don't do that. Nope, 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 nope. That said, the 13 steps to hell in King County now lead to nowhere. Damn. Man, that would have been so cool to check out. That would have been very cool uh, because I did actually look to see if it still existed, and that's when I found out it had been demolished or covered. Right. You know, something like that, and then you got the no trespassing up. So it's a bummer. Leave it to those stupid uh, urban explorers and teenagers to screw up everybody, you know? Absolutely. Well, that was still pretty cool. Uh, I wish we had known about it way back in the day so we could have actually made a uh, a trip up there and checked it out. Because, I mean, anytime there's a quote-unquote gate to hell, yeah, I'm going to try and find it. Yeah. I want to <laughs> see what actually is there, if anything's there. So it sucks that it's already, it's gone, you know. Well, all right, man. Well, why don't we go ahead and take a quick break, and then we'll get started into the uh, second topic of tonight. Absolutely. Okay, so the story of Jake Bird is quite an interesting one. Jake Bird was born on December 14th, 1901. Uh, Not much is known about his early life. What is known is that he was adopted with another boy named Henry by Charles and Deli Bird. Deli is a weird name. The family, which included two more brothers, lived, quote, somewhere in Louisiana where there ain't no post office, according to Jake Bird. And word for word. His home life was a troubled one, which prompted Bird to leave home at 19 and ride the rails across America looking for work. Bird was a stereotypical hobo, hopping a train from one place to the next, finding work as a gandy dander or railroad worker who laid and maintained railroad tracks in the years before machines did the work. That is what a jandy dander is, ah, or a gandy dander is. Okay. It's someone who hopped from train to train, from area to area, to help build the railroad before machines did it themselves. Sweet. Yeah. By day, Bird would work laying railroad lines and by night would rob houses for extra money. He was arrested in Ogden, Utah for the charge of second degree burglary of Pearl Wheatley. He would escape from the Utah jail and later be captured and spend the rest of his sentence in the state pen at Lincoln, Nebraska and was released on January 1st, 1927. Near the end of 1928, around the same time Bird was in Omaha, Nebraska for work, a series of murders would occur between November 18th and November 20th. On the morning of the 18th, J.W. Blackman would be discovered by his son when he came to check on him. His son found Blackman on a daybed covered in blood with his head caved in. Yipe. A bloody axe would be found nearby beneath a wood pile. Then on the 19th, Waldo Resso returned home to find his wife and sister-in-law had been murdered. They had been strangled and their heads had been beaten in with a blunt object. Thankfully, his two sons were unharmed, but according to a newspaper account, a bloody handprint had been smeared across his nine month old face. Damn. Yeah, that's that's pretty psycho. That's that's bad. Then on the morning of the 20th, Harold Stribling and his wife were attacked in their home. Harold was beaten on the head with an axe. Mrs. Stribling was forced to leave the house was taken three miles away to a swamp but would be released later that morning why is unknown and what happened in that time it's unknown that's mm. 
Bird would be arrested on the 23rd and immediately taken to the hospital where Mrs. Stribling was recovering. She then identified Bird as the man who attacked them. In February of 1929, Bird would be convicted of an assault against Harold Stribling, who survived but was listed in critical condition. However, throughout the case and even after, Bird maintained his innocence. There were also several officers who testified on Bird's behalf, as the initial descriptions from Mrs. Stribling did not fit Bird. He was never charged with the murders of Blackman, Resso, or her sister, Creta Brown, but he was sentenced to 30 years for the assault on Harold Stribling, but would end up being released on Christmas Day, 1941. 30 years for an assault? That's harsh. So I guess at this point, I need to go ahead and um, let everybody know that Jake Bird was African-American. Okay. And being... In the South, uh -huh. he was probably handed stricter sentences. And in the 20s? And in the 20s oh, yeah. than his white counterparts. Yes. He would once again hit the rails and end up once again arrested in 1942 in Michigan after committing a series of burglaries. He just couldn't stop. He would receive 4.5 to 5 years in prison and was paroled in August of 1946. Then, the day before Halloween, October 30th, 1947, Bird found himself in Tacoma, Washington, looking for work. However, before any work could be found, he entered the home of Bertha Clutt and her daughter, Beverly June, with the purpose of robbing it. Police were sent to the house to investigate reports of screams. And when a patrol car, manned by Andrew Sabutis and Evan Skip Davies, arrived, they spotted a man running barefoot out the back door and chased after him. The police chased him into the backyard where he crashed through a picket fence, then chased him as he continued through several backyards, finally cornering him in an alley behind Jay Street. The man pulled out a knife and swiped at the officers, hitting Davies in the hand and stabbing Sabutis in the shoulder. Fortunately, Officer Sabutis was a former boxer known as Tiny Lamar, so we have Officers Tiny and Officer Skip. <laughs> the best names ever. Skip and Tiny, Skip I love and Tiny. it. And he was able to take the assailant out with a left hook to the jaw and kick to the groin. <laughs> Yeah, bam. After being taken to the hospital to treat the wounds, the man was identified as Jake Bird. On November 24th, 1947, after only deliberating for 35 minutes, Bird was convicted of the murders of Bertha and Beverly and sentenced to death by hanging. Believing he had been railroaded by the huh, justice system and even his own lawyers, when given the opportunity to make a final statement, he did. Speaking for 20 minutes, Bird announced that because his request to represent himself had been denied and that his own lawyers had it in for him, he would not let this stand. According to court records, Bird announced, and I quote, I am putting the Jake Bird hex on all of you who had anything to do with my being punished. Mark my words, you will die before I do. Wait and see. You policemen and judges will be sitting and waiting at the pearly gates a long time before I roll up. End quote. Bird then won a 60-day reprieve from the governor, by claiming he could clear up at least 44 other murders that he had knowledge of across the country. Of the 44, 11 were eventually substantiated as being committed by Byrd or he had at least participated in. His knowledge of the remaining murders was enough to make him the prime suspect. Byrd would be linked to murders in Illinois, Kentucky, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, and Washington. And that would be entirely possible being a train hopper absolutely man and you know what and that's the perfect cover because you're all over the place you're you, you can yeah. be in three six different states in one day easy i mean you'll probably be there for a day or two and then gone damn so by the time they find the body you're long gone absolutely and most of the time when they when they find a body the first thing to do is try to find somebody there in town that did it man you know so yep. so yeah looking local great cover but i'm i'm three states away in the trains See ya. Bird continued to try and get his conviction overturned, but was denied at every step. While this was going on, it would seem that Jake Bird Hex was working his mojo. Seven people connected with Bird's case would wind up dead in the years leading up to his execution. First up was Edward D. Hodge, the Pierce County Superior Court Judge. He died of a heart attack at the age of 69 on January 1st, 1948. Friends say he was in excellent health prior to his death. That was followed by the chief deputy clerk, Ray Clark, who also died of a heart attack in early April 1948. Clark had worked for the office for five years and never missed a day due to illness. Hmm. Then on April 5th, Joseph E. Karpak, the Pierce County undersheriff, died of a heart attack 
at the age of 46. Man. June 11th would see George Harrigan, the court reporter, also die of a heart attack. He was 69. Tacoma Police Detective Lieutenant Sherman Lyons would follow the same fate at the age of 46 on October 28th. The last death of 1948 would be that of Byrd's defense attorney, James W. Selden, also of a heart attack on November 26th. That is crazy, man. Yeah. A crazy coincidental. And it's not done yet. Jake Bird was sentenced to hang on, on July 15th, 1949, at the Washington State Pen in Walla Walla. Two months before Bird took the drop, his hex would claim one more victim. One of the guards assigned to death row would die of pneumonia. Bird died 14 minutes after being hanged at 12:20 a.m. and was buried in the prison cemetery under convict number 21520. 14 minutes. 14 minutes. So, in other words, his neck didn't break. Neck did not. Apparently, break. he strangled to death hanging. That's 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 good. <sighs> yeah. You don't want him to have a quick death for a killer. Yeah. It would seem, however, that his reign would claim two more victims long after his death. Harold Stribbing and his wife survived the attack and moved to California in 1943. On the morning of February 11th, 1959, Mrs. Stribbing called her doctor complaining of a headache. She was unable to waken her husband from sleep. The doctor called on a neighbor to go and check them. The neighbor found Mr. Stribbing dead and Mrs. Stribbing unconscious from a gunshot wound. When police arrived, they found Mrs. Stribbing conscious but unable to recall the shooting. No one knows what prompted Mr. Stribbing to attempt a murder-suicide, but family members believe he never fully recovered from the attack by Jake Bird in 1928. Man. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. That the is Jake crazy. Jake Bird Hex claims Jake Bird seven, Hex. just like he said, seven people. And, you know, normally, okay, these are, well, these are all people from um, Washington, so it's not the South, so they don't have, I'm thinking heart attacks, some of them are 60, maybe it's just cholesterol, because they're in the south and they eat like heavy food. But these are all in Washington, yeah. so they're up north. So they don't have that southern food that they're eating. That's true. Some of them are 69, but 69 is, I mean, it's not an uncommon age for a heart attack. 46, the ones that were 46, probably. But the fact that all of them died, well, all but one died in a in the 11th month span in 1948 before Jake yeah. hung was, I mean, it's either the greatest coincidence ever, or in fact, he had some sort of a hex that would actually... You never know. Yeah. That's what makes all these stories so dang cool. Yeah. Yeah. This was really neat. I mean, I mean, it sucks that, you know, seven people had to die before he died, but. True enough. Yeah. But also the fact that he was probably connected to 44 additional murders makes him quite a. Uh, and he helped them with them. That's what I was getting. Uh, you know, when I was seeing that, listening to that, that he actually helped them. Well, of course he did. He wanted to extend. He didn't, he didn't want to get hanged. So he wanted to extend his stay as long as possible. Says, I'll help you. I'll help you. But then tacked himself onto 11 more murders by helping. So, yeah. Yeah. Trying to get his conviction overturned. Well, he got what he got what was coming to him. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, uh, another good episode. Had a lot Absolutely. Learn some good stuff. Yeah, man. So that's um, that's Washington, dude. That's that's uh, Jake Bird. Uh, Hex, man. It's pretty crazy stuff, huh? Like it. Good story, man. So don't forget to go rate and review us if you get a chance anywhere you listen to your podcast. And also check us out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash state of fear. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you uh, next time. Next episode, we uh, will have some ghosts and some werewolves. Nice. So get ready for that. Dig it. We'll see you all then.